All right, well, welcome everybody to uh, our next session. This one focuses on organics, GMOs, and uh, GE products. Um, and we have a terrific panel. Uh, I'm gonna try to, as you probably just overheard in my directions to our panelists, I'm gonna try to stay out of this as much as possible because uh, we have three people who bring uh, considerable expertise and experience and different perspectives in the food industry. I would just gum up the work, so I'm gonna to try to stay out of it. So uh, let me start uh, with some brief introductions. You have a more detailed uh, bio in your, your booklet, but to my immediate left is Aaron Bunkley. Aaron is the CEO of the Organic Family Farms Cooperative, uh, which is a recently, what is it, six week old? I think Maybe eight. Eight week old. <laughs> Sam behind the times already. Uh, eight week old cooperative of organic family farms. Uh, and that comprises what percent of the organic milk market? About 12% of the organic milk production in the U.S. So... You know, for a, for a, you know, for a for a eight week old startup to have a twelve percent market share, uh, you can tell that Erin's doing uh, something right, and uh, she'll talk a little bit more uh, about those farms and the opportunities. Erin uh, has a degree in applied mathematics. So if we get into difficult math problems, I'm bailing and I'm turning to Aaron. Uh, and, and then, as you can see in the bio, has uh, had a, a, a variety of really, really interesting uh, experiences in consulting, in uh, corporate strategy, in uh, nutraceuticals, and now in food. Uh, so Aaron, thank you, for, who traveled, by the way, all the way from Santa Fe uh, to join us. Uh, so we, we appreciate you coming up for this. And then uh, to Aaron's left is Kevin Deal, who uh, comes from Des Moines, uh, although he came from Des Moines by way of Washington and arrived <laughs> early this morning. Uh, and uh, Kevin is uh, with uh, Dow uh, DuPont, uh, and it's Cortiva is the name of the agriculture yep. division. Yep. Um, and uh, so he is a scientist, a, a specialist in uh, regulatory matters um, uh, concerning uh, a variety of feedstocks and seed stocks uh, and, and all things agricultural uh, and has great expertise in uh, federal regulation as well as the practical aspects of uh, dealing with uh, uh, genetically engineered uh, products around the globe and, and the effects of regulation in this country on foreign markets and regulation in foreign countries on production and adoption of technologies in, in the United States, which will be an interesting perspective. And then at the far left, uh, at least my far left at the table, I guess you're right, is Tom O'Brien. Tom is the general counsel of Driscoll's, uh, which you may know uh, as the Berry uh, people from Washington. Watsonville, California, right. uh, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, Tom has a fascinating background as well. He's a, a former um, uh, Washington hand himself, and and I believe wrote or had a role in writing the initial organic regulations. Yep. So um, you know, so he obviously knows the ins and outs of. Well, we've seen it's a badge of honor, but yes. <laughs> well, I, I think so. I mean, I think perspective is always good. <laughs> so uh, you know, and to have someone who wrote the book, as they say, is, is fabulous. And then uh, Tom was in uh, private practice, uh, and then um, uh, oversees all the legal efforts at Driscoll's, which. Although you see them uh, all over the place in the produce aisle uh, in in the U.S., also uh, you know is is uh, you know important around the world and uh, is really at the you know has, has a, a terrific uh, uh, track record and and perspective on how successfully to market organic products and the economics of that as well as the, dealing with the regulations and and Tom also has some great things to offer uh, in terms of the the uh, uh, direct of the organic market, uh, both here and abroad. Um, and so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over just initially, uh, if I could, to Kevin to, to set the table a little bit.
bit and talk about uh, whatever you want to call it, GMOs or genetically engineered uh, products, um, which is an interesting topic. And I'm sure Kevin will go into this, but as you know, uh, it is something that stirs a lot of passion. Um, you know, and you get very different perspectives. So the uh, the makers of Soylent proudly have an advertising campaign that say, you know, uh, pro GMO. And if you look at their website, it it has a treatise on why GMO is the savior of the planet. And I don't, I don't say that to be uh, facetious or ironic or anything. I mean, it, it sets out and says, you know, if you're going to feed the world uh, and you need to have certain yields and you need to be resistant to uh, certain pests and you need to be a good steward of the land, uh, these are techniques. Uh, you know, and people have been uh, uh, genetically modifying uh, uh, plants since at least the Phoenicians. Uh, my early history is kind of weak, so I'm not going before that. Um, and uh, it, it lays out an interesting case. And on the other side, you have people who feel very strongly that, uh, you know, products that are modified from uh, what uh, what exists in nature or at least are not disclosed, uh, you know, as a hazard and best avoided. And and there are interesting perspectives. And there are sub-markets, too, as you'll hear. So I told you I would stop talking. I better stop doing it. So, uh, Kevin, if you want to take it away and if you want to operate the clicker for the, the first couple slides, uh, sure. why don't you take it away? Sure. Thanks. So I um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with this group today. And certainly if you've got questions as we go through, uh, please flag flag us and uh, we'll, we'll answer those uh, in real time. Um, it, thinking about the whole GMO debate and, and what that technology is, we've been using those, those tools and techniques for about 25 years where there have been products in the marketplace. Um, there's you know, a lot of debate that has, has sprung up around right to know and that's translated into the, uh, the federal labeling standard uh, that uh, USDA is working on right now. And it, it, that's an important uh, discussion. Uh, if you look at our business, uh, we obviously are excited about the technology and what GMOs actually bring in terms of farmer and consumer benefits, whether it's reduced uh, pesticide use, uh, better grain quality uh, with some of those products, and uh, uh, you know, some uh, no-till opportunities and things like that. So there are a lot of benefits that uh, uh, certainly hit the farmer, certainly uh, impact positively, we think, the environment, uh, but also the consumer when you think about things like modified oils, like uh, a Hyolix uh, soybean oil, for example. So those are, um, I think, opportunities and some of the benefits of the GM technology. There are a lot of uh, questions uh, that uh, you typically see on social media about uh, the overall safety of those products. I can tell you that they're some of the most studied products that, uh, that exist right behind pharmaceuticals and, uh, you know, are, are natural proteins uh, that exist in the environment in, in many ways. So um, when you look at that and you think about the benefits, uh, you know, we see that those are important technologies to continue to use. By the same token, uh, we're the largest producer of non-traded uh, products in corn, soybeans, and, and some of the other crops. So we do believe in consumer choice and in farmer choice around what technologies they want to use and how they want to farm. And, and we think those are important. Um, this discussion then translates or, or moves into the uh, genetic engineering space and uh, talking about gene editing, which is one of the, the common things that you'll hear now using tools like CRISPR-Cas or talons or zinc fingers to make changes at the molecular level that with great specificity that uh, you couldn't do in the past. And uh, those, those tools have great utility in human therapeutics. You're going to see a, a ton of innovation that happens in that space, treating some pretty devastating diseases. So those are in the works. You'll see it in the animal space in terms of, of improving disease resistance and reducing antibiotic use. And you'll see it in, in the plant space as well. Uh, doing things to, to modify plants more quickly than you can do via traditional breeding 
but using a plant's own genetic material, not inserting foreign DNA, to actually create variation. And that's something that's been going on for thousands of years. In this particular case, you've speeded it up a bit. Uh, so the question is always, when you think about diversity that exists within a genetic code of a plant, how much is really there? And I think this is a good example of that. When you start with wild mustard, which nobody consumes, it's basically an industrial crop. And from that starting point, through natural breeding and natural selection, over the course of years, we've selected for all of these different vegetables that we consume and consider to be safe today. Now, my kids wish that kale hadn't been selected for, <laughs> but uh, you know, other than that, they're pretty good with the rest of the list. Uh, but I just use this slide as an illustration to show that when you talk about plant breeding innovation, so focusing on gene editing, it's using a plant or a species own genetic material and making modifications to that to get new and innovative products. You can do things like disease resistance. Uh, this is a list uh, that you see in the literature today. This is changing daily about the, the types of things that uh, are, are being looked at by researchers all over the globe, uh, including uh, significant academic labs as well as small startups. So it's not just large companies uh, using this technology. And there are a lot of solutions that we believe uh, can be delivered using these tools and, and done in a very efficient and effective manner. One of the challenges, and if you rewind what uh, happened with GMOs and, and understand some of the lineage of why there's some of the public outcry that you have today, it goes back to who was the target that audience that you talked to at the time. So when that technology came out, one, there were all kinds of promises about what it would deliver. And quite frankly, it fell a little bit short of that. Now, there were some reasons for that. One, it got overhyped. Number two, because of the regulatory paradigm that started to be built around the globe, it started to narrow the types of products that you could actually afford to bring. And it relegated it to large companies that had deep pockets that could be able to afford that regulatory scheme. Today, if you look at, uh, at the global uh, regulatory requirements to bring a new product to market, just the, the regulatory expense alone for a new GM product is north of $50 million. And it takes between 10 and 13 years of study, safety assessments, and that kind of thing, as well as, as the policy work that has to be done. That starts to limit some of the solutions and the types of products that you can bring. It's important when you talk about the technology, we're excited about that excited about how some of the regulatory path is starting to frame up. But the most important thing that I think we need to think about is that social license or acceptance. We need to talk about this technology openly, transparently, and in a different way to actually show the potential benefits that exist for consumers. It's not just for farmers, and we need to have that dialogue. So, Great. Thanks for that, and, and we'll uh, come back to you in a little bit to talk about uh, the um, regulations that are still being promulgated by USDA, but maybe, Aaron, I could turn to you a little bit and, and uh, get your thoughts on, uh, you know, consumer trends in the organic space and, and why you were drawn to uh, the organic space uh, coming out of the, the pharma industry. So I'll, I'm going to start with more general just nutritional category trends because I think that that drives a lot of what people are looking for in terms of organic and non-GMO and all that comes into play. Um, if you talk to consumers about what's most relevant to them right now in terms of just their overall nutrition, people are leading more active lifestyles. They're wanting to embrace this concept of being healthy for a long time. They're moving completely away from processed foods. They want single ingredients, simple foods, local where they can. People are just much more interested in being both connected with their environment and using their food to fuel their body for health and activity in a very different way than when we, you know, I don't know, when I grew up eating Kraft macaroni and cheese, which is no longer exactly the kind of food we think is the best for us. 
And so you're seeing a, a real change there in what people think is good for them in terms of the amount of processing that goes into food, the types of ingredients. Obviously, sugar, we all unfortunately, I think is bad. Um, I still like to eat a little piece of candy every so often, but try not to. And so people have really changed their mindset about what they're looking for. And then that plays into the organic and non-GMO space. Um, it's interesting about what people perceive to be true and what's actually true. I'm sure many of you are aware that if something is organic, it, to meet the organic regulations, it must be also non-GMO. Um, a lot of consumers don't understand that, and they think that they're separate things. And so, for example, all of the milk from our dairies is both USDA organic certified and non-project, non-GMO project verified, to just drive home that point that we offer both of those offerings. One of the interesting trends we're actually seeing is a lot of people, organic gets a lot deeper into the farming practices and into the fact that you can't give, I mean, to actually create a dairy that's organic, for three years you have to allow the land to have no chemicals touch it before a cow even comes onto it. And then it's another year or two to get all the cows up and running. So to move to an organic space from a farming perspective is a very long-term play. But what you're committing to is that the quality of, in our case, milk, that you're going to get out on the other side actually has higher and better and different nutritional value than conventional milk. And there are all sorts of tests that they've run that show that when you go to these practices where you take out the antibiotics and all of the drugs and the hormones and all of those things, and you go back to a more natural situation where cows, part of also for organic cows, must pasture graze for a certain period of time in the year when the weather is appropriate. And so when you move to that model where they're pasture grazing whenever it's appropriate and only supplementing with organic feed when you have to, the profile of the milk you get is very different. And so a lot of consumers understand that and are embracing the fact that as I think about I want simple nutrition for my body, organic and non-GMO play into that. The other thing that I personally am seeing, I'm sure you are seeing some of it too in the industry, is a lot of people now are just looking for non-GMO versus organic and don't fully understand that difference. And that's something that I think is very important that we continue the dialogue about to help people understand non-GMO is one thing and organic is a completely different level of both regulation and attention to how you're going to you know, create whatever your product is, whether it's berries or strawberries or corn or or cows for dairy products, that it's, that's a whole practice of farming. And so it's a whole different way of approaching how you generate food. And it is absolutely not the most efficient way to generate lots of food off of a small piece of land. What it is, is it's a very effective way to generate very food that has a much more um, potent nutritional value to you and that it guarantees you're not adding additional hormones or drugs into your body by consuming food that has had exposure to those things. And so it's a very different dialogue. And in my mind, that's going to be an ongoing trend for consumers as they're wanting to go with their health is to really figure out how do I continue to make organic an important part of my life? Because I know I look at my 12 year old son and he's never had anything other than organic milk. And because I don't want any hormones or anything else going into his soon already charging up hormone fed body. And so, you know, people are looking at that and just making different choices than they did than when we were growing up. And we didn't have as much education about what the farming practices we were doing were doing to the food that we were actually consuming into our bodies. Well, Tom, uh, to pick up on that, because I know that, that uh, Driscoll's both has a you know huge uh, focus on organics as well as conventional, uh, but is also uh, interested in improving uh, its plant stock for uh, better flavor, better transport, what have you. Uh, so why don't you, you share with us a little bit uh, your perspectives on the organic market and what it takes to succeed there and also uh, where in the, the spectrum of consumer choice you see a role for, uh, for GM? Okay, yeah, I mean, or, organics is very important, <coughs> excuse me, to Driscoll's, to our, our growers who are independent. We breed the plants, we market the fruit, growers uh, grow it and get most of the revenues back. And that's just a business model that grew out of how we were formed as a company. Um, or Because we grow primarily on along the California coast, at least for the U.S. consumer, other than in the winter when we're in Mexico, 
you know, th that coastal land is really valuable property. So uh, it's also increasingly encroached by humans, such as, you know, this is where I live, in fact. Um, and so those two things come together. It makes it really important to get that premium price that organics offer, and it's probably the only certification program I know that, that really pulls in a premium. Um, there are a lot of certifications, and maybe there are some others, maybe fair trade or something, but as far as I know, you know, organic uh, delivers that premium. And also, in California and other places, there are a lot of rules around spraying of pesticides near schools and other things, and other places where people live that make it harder to do or, uh, conventional agriculture in these areas that are, where humans are encroaching into the land. So, so there are a lot of reasons to move us increasingly to organics, but particularly because of um, uh, the, the premium and the consumer demand. It's interesting when you think about the premium, to, to my mind, organics is both incredibly fragile and incredibly stable. Because one, there is that premium, and, and now the rules have been in place for 20 years, and, and that's, that premium's persistent. And I think why people buy <coughs> organics can vary. I think some do it for health reasons, some do it for environmental reasons, some do it for taste reasons. They want a tomato they feel like that will taste like a tomato. Um, but they still do it. And uh, it, it's an overstatement, although I appreciate the compliment to say I sort of wrote the rules for organics, but I, I was kind of the Sherpa of the rules when I was at USDA. And there were a couple lessons I drew from that that I think still play out in this sort of both being fragile and also stable world. Um, we had, it, it was the 1990 Farm Bill that passed rules commanding USDA to issue organic rules. But Congress didn't appropriate money f to actually, you know, put the, the boots on the ground to draft those rules until like 93, which is about the time I came to USDA. W we didn't get the rules published until 97. And in between, there were a lot of internal debates about what is organic. And the first time we took the rule to the Office of Management and Budget, put it down, the, the head of that office that reviews all regulations said, well, I get very nervous when you take 500 pages to define a single word. <laughs> and we just thought, uh-oh, this is not gonna go well. And they had concerns, legitimate concerns, about what this really new thing, what it was saying in the broader context. Our draft said no GMOs in organics. We weren't trying to take a, a U.S. government position in terms of the safety of GMOs, and there were a lot of uh, conversations going on at that time with Europe ab about that topic. We were simply trying to find what was organics. Same with uh, irradiation and sewage sludge. And so we, the rule stopped for a number of years as we were sort of at loggerheads. The agriculture people saying we wanted to find what's organics, others in the, uh, in the government with other portfolios worrying about how that would impact these, these larger issues. So finally we did, what we sometimes said is we did, we wanted to get the rule out in the worst way possible, and we did. <laughs> we, we took no position on these really hot button issues. Um, we, we said, hey, give us your opinion on should GMOs be considered part of organics? And we, we received 400,000 <laughs> negative comments um, and, and regardless of what rule I had, role I had going forward, I know, and, and regardless of all the bosses I had above me, I was the one sent out on the road to, to get comments from the public um, and to explain how we'll get it right eventually. And, and USDA got it right eventually. And I don't mean to tell war stories, but, but I, I think there's a, a lesson we see today and both kind of the left and the right attack organics, and I, and I don't mean left and right in kind of the political sense, but maybe traditional and, and organic true believers or something, both kind of attack this thing in the middle, um, and it survived it, but I think it's always subject to attack. There's always a sense of 
well, this is a good thing. This should belong in organics. I think that the conversations about gene editing will be one of those. And, you know, I don't know whether that's yes or no. I mean, we do traditional breeding that sometimes doesn't look all that different from it. Mm -hmm. But I think consumers have to be, get there, and the organic industry has to get there before that happens. And so I, I'm, I'm very cautious about changes to the rules or changes even to the process. You know, in that period where USDA couldn't do anything on organics, the advisory board began. They did appoint an advisory board. And that's really become the focus of a lot of debate within the, the organic industry. And people that try to short circuit that debate, I think, often pay a big price. And it certainly happened in the organic dairy industry to some of the companies over the years. Um, at the same time, the attacks come from the other side. I, I think the easiest story to write about organics is, oh, Big Ag is watering down what's pure and holy about organic agriculture. You see it time and again, it's just, it's, it's an easy story to write. There's always a, a mistrust of USDA. Believe me, as somebody responsible for some of that mistrust, I mean, I get it, but, but I think it's often sort of too easy. And, and if you look in deeper, it, it, it doesn't often sort of suggest what's really going on. So I think organics, it, it certainly, its history was sort of an alternative to conventional agriculture. I think that idea of, well, which are you? Are you conventional or are you organic? That binary way of looking at things is, is outdated to those who are sort of responding to consumer trends. I, 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 I have, you know, growers that look just like what you'd expect the organic grower to look like. I also have growers who look like and are the most sort of traditional Republican, you know, fourth generation farming the same land who are, who are growing just as well organically as anyone else. I mean, I, I, th I think some of those ideas have sort of gone away and, you know, at the end of the day, organics responds to the marketplace and, and, and that market incentive has survived various attacks from the left and right and remain important to us and kind of to our viability. So Aaron, to, to pick up on that a little bit, I, I appreciate your per, uh, perspective on uh, you know, the rate at which uh, the organic market is growing is, and is it uniform or you, know, you, you mentioned you are non-GMO, uh, you've got the butterfly which we'll talk about in a moment, which has now come under assault, uh, and as well as organic. And then there are others who are organic but may have some genetically engineered uh, stuff and view it as a farming practice. And then as, as Tom is talking about, um, you know, you have some of the people, you know, living communally who, you know, wonder why uh, some of the big food processors are buying up organic operations. How do you, maybe you could lay out your thoughts on where the market is, where it's going, is it growing, at, at what point, uh, you know, is the price point going to limit growth? Uh, I know there's a lot there, so you can, yes. you know, pick and choose any of those, and, you know, pick two. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll pick one. Okay. Um, you know, I can speak to the organic milk market much better than the overall market, because I don't look at the, the data for the full market, but from a dairy consumption perspective, organic Conventional dairy has been uh, declining for a number of years, and organic dairy consumption has been growing. In the most recent year, it's closer to flat. It's up about 1%. Um, although, if you look at what's happened at shelf in the most recent year, there have been a lot of um, holes on the shelf where, where uh, people just haven't been delivering the milk. And so that, in my opinion, suppresses demand. When you go there and the product isn't there, you can't buy it. Um, so the overall consumer demand for organic, at least in the dairy space, is still relatively strong and, and it's going against the trend of conventional milk in a very big time way. And we definitely see that continuing as you think about what is important to consumers and if you talk to them about what they think they're looking for and relating it to their lifestyle, the idea of reconnecting them to the farms, of having this sense of, of knowing where your milk is coming from, knowing what these products look like, is very important. Um, what we are continuing to see as a differentiator in the market is certifications in addition to just the USDA organic. So we are project non-GMO verified, 
but our dairies are also valid as animal welfare certified, which is the hardest animal welfare certification to get. And when you go and talk to a number of major retailers like Kroger, for example, they won't talk to you anymore if you don't have valid as certification. And so you're starting to see consumers actually demand more certifications from the milk so they really understand what is it that I'm getting and how do I know that those animals are being treated well and how do I know that all of this adds up to both the ethos of what I want and the health of what I want. And so I do think from a trend perspective in the marketplace, you're going to continue to see consumers ask for actually more and more validation that what you're doing really matches up with what they're looking for. And certifications are an easy, you know, consistent way to do that, although I know non-GMO specifically has had a, a tad of controversy associated with it over the years. Um, and, and as we talked about genetic Fortunately, only a tad. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> as we talk about genetic engineering, I, I think that opens a whole new world because that is replicating what's happened in nature, which is very different and can be very good to we reduce the dependencies on antibiotics and other drugs. And so I think we're entering into a whole new and exciting time about figuring out how that plays in to both improve our farming practices, but also to find a, a balance between, you know, organic, which is very rigorous on its farming practices, but if you can use, you know, something that is essentially natural to, you know, speed up their own genetic, you know, process that's going to happen eventually anyway, to make the cows be able to not have antibiotics, you know, that could be huge for us. Um, you, know, you hear these stories from the dairy farmers about when they, you know, you have to raise your cow organically so it cannot have, the calves cannot have any drugs. And that's a huge change from how dairies have been run for years and years and years. And you hear stories of the, you know, the dairy farmer holding the calves in their arms and using all these different methods to get them through that period without drugs. And if you could make that easier through genetic engineering and consumers will accept that that is actually a natural process, I think you're talking about a very game-changing intersection of a, a farming practice that I feel very strongly is right, but being able to shore that up through the use of technology in a responsible way. Great. So, Kevin, I'm, I'm going to swing that back to, to you for a moment and, and just a uh, again, you can choose any one of these that you want to talk about. But, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and please, those of you in the audience, I mean, raise your hands uh, to focus in on things that are of particular import to you, uh, which may be very different from my multiple uh, choice questions. But um, so one thing, if you could uh, comment, and I'd be interested uh, also, Tom and Aaron, on this, on the, the lawsuit that recently was brought to um, in an attempt to uh, invalidate non-GMO labeling on the grounds that it improperly suggests that uh, GMO products are necessarily bad for you, uh, if you have a perspective on that. And, and then maybe uh, from that, you could give us your perspectives, Kevin, on where you think uh, USDA is going to come out on its uh, final regulations in terms of uh, thresholds, in terms of uh, uh, whether CRISPR and some of these other technologies are going to be covered, uh, and so forth. So uh, there's a lot packed in there. Um, <laughs> so, you could object to compound. Yeah, <laughs> uh, um, so uh, the first comment that I'll make is when, and it supports, I think, what, what Aaron and Tom have both said, and that is that there's there's a lot of change that's happening in the food industry. You know, people want the food story, they want to have a connection, those kinds of things. And and you know, if I look at our company and what we're trying to do, we we have customers in all of those segments. And so you want to support those. I think the biggest challenge that exists right now, and it, it goes to the uh, the labeling uh, with the non-GMO project, is intent and you know, in the whole space, there's room for organics, there, there is room for conventional agriculture, and the vilification of production systems is not helpful, especially when it's driven by misinformation. And that's, I think, core to the problem. And, you know, in, in certain cases, the, the drive for labeling in the GM space was not the end goal. The end goal was label, brand, vilify, have it go away. I mean, that, that is the articulated plan of, of the folks who have start, or started that movement. And so, you know, that's, I think, something that is challenging because those tools 
and the limitation of those tools um, have consequences. Uh, if you look at today from a safety perspective, I mean, we, we have, you know, there are always uh, comments brought up about the safety of the GM technology. We have 20 plus years of safety assessment with real world, 100 billion animals in the U.S. alone that have been fed predominantly diets that contain GM technology. And every metric that you can look at shows that you have healthier, livestock, you have greater rate of gain, you have higher quality grain, you've got fewer stillbirths due to mycotoxins and other things. And so it, um, you know, there are benefits. Now, at the same time, somebody can choose and they should be allowed to choose and farmers should be allowed to make a premium uh, on, on organic produce and organic crops. That, that's fine. Let's just not vilify uh, you know, each other's uh, technologies and put things out there in a very factual way. So, so does this unvilify it? The, uh... I, th I think it, um, <laughs> so it, it's interesting. It looks so the, friendly. Yeah, these are, these are friendly label, uh, labels that uh, have been proposed, and they've actually gone back, and I don't know what the new ones will look like, but... Uh, these ones are smiling and winking. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I will say from, from a, uh, a legacy DuPont pioneer perspective and a DuPont perspective, we were supportive of the labeling efforts. Uh, as much as it's a challenge for me personally from a science perspective, because the science doesn't warrant it, but from a transparency and a consumer acceptance perspective, we shouldn't hide from it. Uh, also, the patchwork of state-by-state state regulations that were starting to, to uh, pop up were just not tenable for, for commerce. And so having a federal standard, uh, because in the absence of a federal standard, what you have is the non-GMO project de facto setting standards. That group has set standards for what is acceptable and what's not, and, and there is an agenda that exists there. Um, and you can just go to their website to, uh, to understand what that is. So by having a federal standard, it, it levels the playing field. It says we're going to go at this from a science-based perspective, and hence they've, uh, they've defined what is in and what's out. They've gone through the comment period, uh, which uh, opened up in May. I think USDA, um, they're catching flack right now and they're being sued for not hitting the legislative deadline, which was in July. Um, there were some reasons for that. Number one was actually getting appointees into USDA to actually run that process. But they've taken, I think, a very uh, methodical process doing both outreach, as was mandated in the legislation, as well as the, the comment period they had thousands of comments. They kind of got bucketed into three categories. So one was uh, actually related to these images, said, uh, okay, so what do the logo and the words actually need to mean? I mean, there were certain folks that looked at these and said they're too happy. Um, you know, there are other folks that, you know, said, you know, what, what they should look like, what words should actually be on a package. And so there's a lot of discussion in the commentary about that. The, the second thing uh, was about highly processed or refined products. So things like oil and sugar, which are highly processed, there's no genetic material left in those. And so when you look by definition, what they have in the bioengineered law, Technically speaking, those should be excluded. Now that is up to, and there's some discretion given to the Secretary of Agriculture on how they're going to, to look at those things. And I'm not sure how that's gonna come out. They've taken a lot of input uh, on that. Uh, so that's, that was the second bucket. The third bucket was on thresholds and inclusion rates. And at what point and what level, you know, what percent of volume, what percent of an ingredient, would ultimately qualify to say, okay, that's free from. Uh, because uh, in the world that we live in, uh, you know, testing systems and that kind of stuff, I mean, you can be down in the parts per trillion, parts per quadrillion, uh, with the genetic uh, fingerprinting that we have now, you can find that proverbial needle in a haystack. 
you know, and so it, when you're dealing with biological systems, an absolute zero in biology doesn't exist. And so those are things that all need to be codified. Um, what it, what we think is going to happen, I think OMB actually has the rule right now. Uh, Secretary Ibob actually made a comment publicly a couple weeks ago that uh, we may be seeing those regulations come out and the standards that they've set sometime in December. And we'll see if that happens, but they're trying to move through this process as quickly as possible. All right. So, uh, Tom, back to you. Let, if, if you could talk about maybe the uh, uh, growth of the organic market and the opportunities in the organic space, and, and Aaron, jump in on this as well, uh, both in the U.S. and uh, worldwide. That would be interesting to hear where you think uh, this is going. Yeah, and, and I don't have any of the, the marketing numbers. <laughs> Aaron may have more, but it's been steady and consistent growth for a long time. For us, the biggest reason why we don't sell more organics is, is getting organic land into production. You know, the, the three-year wait where you can have no synthetics on the land mean that farmers have to transition. And we try to do things so that they're, they're kind of doing those things that require the premium, but not yet getting the premium. So if, if we can ship those to export markets that will get a, them a higher price, we can induce more people to getting into organics. But that's our biggest constraint. It's not so much that we could sell a lot more organic berries if, if we had them. Um, we operate differently in that our model is, you know, independent growers growing for that market. And, and we've done that same thing in Europe and Australia and a few other places. And so we're not shipping a lot of organic berries to other markets necessarily. We'll do that on occasion. But you got to put berries on a plane if they're going to go a long distance, and that gets hard to do. So we'll grow in Europe and, we, and in, in Australia. We've not done as much organics there as we have just because we wanted to get started and do it. And so it remains sort of a work in progress in those other markets. But it's in our plans to do more and more, and consumers want it. You, you, you didn't mention China. Uh, I mean, I don't want to have you disclose your business secrets uh -huh. here, but, uh, uh, you know, is there an organics market in China? Uh, is it something where there are particular barriers to entry? Or are there different regulations there that would uh, make it complicated? W while we are in China, we're not growing organically okay. there just yet. So it's not something I know of what, how you would get a certification. I know of programs where they're certified for the U.S. market, China I don't has its own certification. It? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry. To yeah, no, you. no, <laughs> please do. Um, China has its own certification process that is very similar to the USDA organic process. Mm -hmm. And they actually will send, you fill out all the paperwork just like you would. They send an inspector to the United States if, if you're going to ship product from the United States over. They'll send a Chinese inspector to inspect your land, your facility, make sure that it's meeting all the same standards. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective, there is a very large market in China for organic products because food security and food safety is so important to them. And between that and the rising of this middle class there who is incredibly status conscious, the idea of being able to give your child organic food to them is a huge status symbol. And so we see that market as, as very, important as you just look at the population concentration there and the rise of that middle class and people having money to now spend on organic food and then prioritizing that because they see that as both food security but also a status among their peers that they are able to provide that for their children. So uh, in, in keeping or, or tying it together with what uh, Tom had said earlier, I mean, it, uh, there's one issue which is consumer demand for organic and then if I understand Tom correctly, there's also a production constraint. Um, you know, for the reasons that Tom articulated in the milk space, do you see the? Is there a similar constraint? Uh, do, are you able to sign up more farms, or, or I know you're very selective about the farms. Yeah, we're very selective about our farms. There are a lot of dairy farms in the United States. I would say right now there's not a need, and from a milk perspective, to have more organic dairies per se. What I think is going to potentially completely shift this market over the next, you know, two to five years, is as there becomes more demand to ship milk products out of the United States organically, 
then that will create that similar shortage. And we're already starting to see that in just the last few months that the market has gone from having a lot of milk to the milk supply actually being pretty tight. And a lot of that is because people are finding more and more ways to move their products outside of the United States, the tariffs notwithstanding. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, the, see, you, you, you guessed where I was going with this next question. I mean, uh, rumor had it that, uh, or has it, that there's a trade dispute between our country and China um, that shows no sign of abating. Um, so what does that mean? Um, and, and uh, you know, Kevin, please jump into this as well. I'm not limiting it to organics, but in terms of what sectors are directly impacted or what are the, you know, what's happening in the marketplace. I think, Kevin, you mentioned to me that stuff's being shipped to Argentina so it can then uh, avoid tariffs or what have you. Uh, how, how is this changing, whether it's the organic market or, or uh, markets in general? Do you want to take? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, there are some fairly unnatural movements that are <laughs> happening right now. <laughs> in the marketplace uh, because of the, uh, the, the tariffs. And w when you look at uh, in the Midwest, to put it in perspective, one in three acres of soybeans that you see as you drive through the countryside actually end up in China. So it's, it's huge. When you hear farmers talking about impact on prices, it's real. Um, and China is a huge consumer uh, of uh, soy meal and soybeans in general and they are continuing to grow that. Um, they, they can't produce them um, economically and in enough quantity in country to be self-sufficient, uh, especially in soybeans. In corn, they are uh, pretty much self-sufficient. Um, so what you're seeing now is movement of grain. Argentina's crop was not quite as strong as what it had been Brazil's either. So you can, uh, Traders right now can buy soybeans in the U.S. They can afford to ship them down and then ship them over and, and still make money. So you have some of those things going on. The, the other thing that is, is happening and it is impacting the ability of American farmers to actually adopt new technology because of the regulatory system that exists in China. So as an example, our company has five different products, GM products that are in the approval process right now, essentially kind of the final stages. Those products- uh, Approval were process in China? In China, okay. because you have to get global, you have to get approval in every country around the globe that your grain will go to and go through that, that process and get uh, uh, registrations. In China, um, you know, we made those submissions in 2012 and 2013, respectively, for those five products. Uh, some of those products have been through five rounds of questions uh, from a technical standpoint. Um, what you're seeing, so they have a, a technical system, which, if followed, is robust. Um, but the overlay of the political uh, ramifications distort the science. So when you think about science and policy, they don't always go like this. And right but now- But that's unique to China. Uh, that's pretty globally <laughs> yeah. uh, universal, but- It was, it was a joke. Yes, <laughs> it's, um, you know, we do have, uh, it, it's, it's a serious issue in China because those, those products, which could be on the market today with U.S. farmers, could have been in the market because you have global approvals everywhere else uh, in the world except China, they could have been using those products for the last four to five years. New technology, better yields, higher quality, things like that. And you can't uh, because you risk trade disruptions. Uh, you look at some things that have happened in the last year in terms of a trait perceived to be out of place. and. I don't know, $1.5 billion worth of liability that uh, was associated with that. So these are, these are significant issues that the politics are fully interwoven into that, and they ultimately result in, in farmers around the globe. It's not just the U.S. Uh, Brazil, Argentina, we're a global company. This te certain technologies can be moved uh, between countries, and you're held up. Aaron, do you see uh, the trade dispute affecting uh, the organic market in China? I mean, are, are the certification standards going to be held up or whatever? Uh, you know, we haven't seen a change in the certification process at this point, and we actually have 
several farms undergoing active certifications with China. From our perspective, the Chinese government is still being open to that part of it, and they're still encouraging commerce. Um, but at the end of the day, when the tariffs come in on both sides, it, I don't know that the consumer demand for it can withstand that level of, of tariff. I mean, it's just on, on both sides, you know, the stuff coming out and then the stuff going back. It's, you know, if we really get to the 25 percent part, I mean, that's, it's impossible almost to make it competitive. And it, I mean, I'm, I'm a free trade kind of girl. And I don't like trade barriers. And I think for, from our particular perspective, being very young and trying to generate a lot of exciting opportunities worldwide, it's unfortunate for our company that at this time, we're in a, an environment where things are happening that, in my opinion, discourage trade and commerce between countries, which I think generally is good for all of us to have that commerce. So I won't go into any Tom, political statements. Yeah, if I could turn, <laughs> absolutely, stay on the topic of tariffs, but turn it to NAFTA. Great. That that's where we see it. That you see with organics, just and and more generally in produce, quite an integration of the markets. Just what kind of NAFTA promised. Um, as I mentioned, we'll grow in Mexico in the winter when we can't grow in California, and the consumer gets year-round supply. Um, the, or I think Canadian has equivalents to the U.S. standards. Mexico is developing their own rules still, but we have certification to, to U.S. standards in Mexico that make the, the production and marketing of organic produce really easy between the three countries. And, and seeing those threats of disruption to that, it, you know, scares our business quite a bit. So. Well, in, in, our, um, in the remaining time, we have to shift off uh, 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 tariffs for a moment, because I'm not sure that uh, the four of us are going to be able to solve that <laughs> problem. Um, uh, you know, your thoughts, you know, uh, I'll just kind of take it in order here. What, you know, uh, what lies ahead in terms of, you know, all of you have spoken at, at uh, uh, various points about the balance between uh, acceptance of new uh, genetic technologies that are not uh, importing new genes or whatever, but are uh, advancing the the process of selecting traits. Uh, where do you see that playing in? How that uh, you see that dovetailing in with uh, organic? Uh, you know, from your perspectives, where do consumers say that's acceptable and that's not acceptable? So you want to start with that, Tom? Sure. Um, for us, it's all about the question you just asked, where are consumers? I mean, you know, gene edit, we have done traditional breeding. We grew out of sort of the plant breeding is the reason why Driscoll's as a company started. We're not gonna be on the, the head of that spear to convince consumers it's okay. That consumers have to demonstrate their acceptance that, that the the close connection between you know the fruit that's grown and the consumer that eats it means that they're looking at it and and if they don't feel that it's for them regardless of whether that's organic or conventional then we just won't use those techniques if they do demonstrate that acceptance then we'll consider it and i don't know what that decision would be but until then you know we we that's why we haven't used genetically modified we haven't seen the need to either uh, for our crops, but but more importantly, it's you know until consumers say it's okay, we we just have to listen to them. Okay, Kevin, do you see an end to the vilification of uh, genetic modification technology, or or where do you see the future role, or or how do you see the art, uh, market segmenting? Sure. So um, with with certain segments, the vilification is going to continue. So you see, um, you know, in social media, GMO 2.0 is is pretty common. Uh, you know, for those that that don't like the technology, um, ultimately um, we have to do a, a better job. And it's it's not about science. Um, and that's hard for me as a scientist to to say that it's not data driven. Uh, because the data is absolutely clear, um, uh, you know, around these technologies and, and, you know, safety and, you know, the specificity of them and that kind of stuff. It's, it's real and it's game changing uh, in terms of what can be delivered for, for new products, better quality products. And that's in a whole host. It's not just in the crops that, that we're focused on with corn and soybeans, wheat, rice 
canola, things like that, but it's in strawberries. It's in uh, crops that uh, farmers in Africa who are subsistence farmers, we have a, a a, a joint uh, arrangement with the Danforth Center in St. Louis. They're doing, they're using those tools to, to modify cassava uh, and teff, which are two subsistence crops that have absolutely a very limited breeding, uh, historical breeding uh, techniques applied to them because they're hard to work with. Uh, there are other crops like, uh, you know, the citrus industry right now. So because of citrus greening, you're looking at 75% uh, of the orange groves that exist in the U.S. are now either gone or about to be gone uh, because of that devastating disease. Hmm. It's going to take a combination of tools, but gene editing is certainly one of the solutions that, that will provide some natural resistance. We believe uh, we're not in that game. It's not a market for us, but in, in terms of tools and techniques and that kind of stuff, working with universities and others to try and develop solutions to those types of problems. Um, I think it's gonna be critical if you look in the organic space, and, and I will tell you the organic tent is a big tent, that there are a whole lot of factions that sit underneath there. Um, and so there are all different perspectives on where gene editing should or should not fit, um, you know, from one spectrum to the other. I can tell you from a sustainability perspective, if you look at things, and I'll, I'll use an example of organic spinach, and if you want to talk about sustainable production, um, they grow 50% more acres than what they actually harvest due to disease. Okay, so that footprint, you're wasting 50% of, of the, the land, and it's expensive where they grow that stuff, the labor, and all the work that goes into it, you know, is that sustainable? And there are gene editing solutions with natural disease resistance that exists that you can help solve for that. So I think there are opportunities. It's far from defined uh, around whether it will be acceptable in organics. Uh, it also is, is far from defined about public acceptance. But what you do see is an openness if you if you look at the market research and you go out and you talk to consumers, they've not formed an opinion yet. They're interested in what it what it might do. What's in it for them is the big question that gets asked. And so it's incumbent upon us and and Corteva AgriScience, we are one of the first to be in this space. We feel a responsibility to, to lead in the right way, but it's not just about us. Uh, this technology is different than what the biotech was because it is not just with the big companies. There's not a lock on it. We've been very careful to democratize as much as possible. Anybody can get a license to the technology uh, that exists today that wants it at, at reasonable sort of uh, you know, engagement things, and they can use those tools. And you know, when you look at the inventor, some of the inventors, uh, whether it's Berkeley or whether it's the Broad Institute, um, we're working together with them because the desire is to get this out there to solve problems. And there are many that exist, and we think that this is one of the key tools in the toolbox, not the only one, but it's a critical one for the future. Great, and Aaron, if I could uh, have you uh, back clean up here. Uh, you know, you've taken uh, individual farms and have, is it a verb, cooperatized them? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so you have 12% market share right off the bat. What, where do you see, uh, you know, whether you want to take organics as a whole or organic milk? I mean, where are the opportunities? Where is the future going in terms of uh, both uh, consumer and then these issues? Uh, that we've uh, been talking about in terms of, you know, organic and what's the cattle standard, the Veritas or? Veritas, yeah, Validus. Validus, I knew it had a V in it. <laughs> uh, the Validus and the, you know, non-GMO butterfly and, and how much, particularly, have, I'm not gonna put you on the spot to say, having heard Kevin, are you gonna, you know, take the butterfly off? But, um, uh, you know, wh where do you see yourselves going and where do you see the market going? You know, I mean, I've given up trying to predict how large groups of people will react to things, because I'm always wrong. Um, from a logical perspective, I, I'm in complete agreement that if we can find a way to leverage science that works in, you know, 
works in parallel with the practices of organic, that that should be very interesting. And I think from a you know, business and just practical perspective, it's really exciting. What I don't know is what consumers will do because consumers are unpredictable. It's, they are irrational. They don't always understand all the facts. Mm -hmm. they, and they form a large opinions in groups of people through ways that no one really fully understands how that happens. So I don't know what they will accept in terms of the genetic engineering, but I think I'm hopeful that they are still open, that there's a chance for a dialogue, and that there's a way to figure out how to leverage the best of technology and the best of farming to, to create you know, great nutrition for generations to come. You know, we're very hopeful about the organic marketplace. I think people continue to see that as a, as a great source of nutrition for themselves, and I think it's gonna continue to grow. And we're just excited to, to be in the mix and to be having these kind of discussions about what the future really could look like. And I think it's, it's a great time to be in the space. Great. Well, I've been having all the fun. So Kelly, <laughs> you, glad you finally were bold enough to raise your hand. So take So if I could, because uh, uh, Laurie's telling me I have to repeat the question. So, uh, <laughs> so, so no, Kelly, no, in all seriousness, so, I mean, the, the, your, your point, which is a good one, is that uh, a G, uh, an organic label is not just stating a fact uh, or a compliance with standard, but is also a marketing tool, which gives you a premium price. So I don't think there's a lot of dispute in that. And, and I think what you were suggesting is, but also by doing that, it, it kind of uh, perpetuates a binary world or, or paradigm between uh, organic, you know, all from the earth and no GMO versus acceptance of that, whereas our panelists have, have suggested that there's a, a middle ground, and, and your question gets to the question of how do you get to that middle ground if, you, if you've got this strong marketing impetus uh, toward being, uh, you know, having a GMO label. Did I roughly capture that? Okay. Panelists? I'll, I'll, All right. I'll start. Um, I guess I disagree with the idea that we're passive. I think we tell our consumers what we do, how we grow the product, what it means to be organic, how we breed our plants. We want to show them who we are. So, so that's not passive. We, we won't do genetic engineering until we know that they'll accept it because what, the, what our consumers want is very important to us. And, and so don't conscript me into a war that I'm not part of. You know, I'm not gonna fight that fight in order to get our consumers to accept, you know, berries that maybe they won't accept. So I'll tell them, I'll tell them who we are. If it's good, I guess the thing is, is if you looked at the technology and said it was good. See, now, now Lori's taking me out of the equation because <laughs> I bungled the last one. I just, my response to that is if, if you look at a technology and you conclude, let's say one specific technology, that it's good for the world or it's good for the environment and as an organic company you believe that it could be consistent with your standards, um, but leaving it up to the consumer, you're never going to get there. That's kind of my question. Well, and, and I probably should have said this to the beginning. You know, our mission, our, so our standard is delighting consumers. And if they don't embrace it, we're not fulfilling our mission. Our mission is not to tell them where they're wrong. You know, when I was in Washington, one of my clients was one of the produce associations, and they got together with retailers, and we're talking about a number of issues, including biotech, and, and really, I mean, I think a lot of growers 
think that this it's a it's a bullshit argument going on and that there are plenty of techniques that should be used and then finally one of the retailers said look guys i'm not in business of telling my customers that what they're thinking is wrong and we all kind of said oh yeah customers that's right <laughs> that is what it's about and so i'm sorry but you know we are going to listen to our customers and our consumers I think to your point that, uh, I mean, one of the areas that, that I find a bit frustrating, and I mentioned the vilification before, but when, when you actually talk to groups, and I have an opportunity uh, from time to time to talk to non-traditional groups that, um, you know, are way away from the farm, uh, state legislators from the South, as an example, that, uh, you know, from, from inner cities, and so you ask the question, of a group like that, and I think it would, would fit uh, in a lot of other venues as well, okay, what does the organic standard mean? And the first comment that they make is that there were no pesticides used in the production of those crops. Okay, that's not true. There's an, there's an approved list of products that are approved and are viewed as being acceptable. And that's and, and natural. Yep. So, uh, you know, and there's, there's also a connection then and, and an incorrect one around the, some of those products being safer and or more sustainable. Uh, as an example, you know, for disease control, covering a field with copper sulfate to... Uh, to control fungus is not the best environmentally uh, friendly practice. There are a lot of other products that do it and have a, a lesser footprint. The reason I use those examples is not, I don't want to vilify that technology, I just want it to be fact-based. And when you get into the marketing, to your point about the polarization of it, I think that's where some of that happens. You know, it's, it's fine to use those, it should be uh, I mean, and there, there are some benefits that are, are attached to some of those practices that, that are scientifically not real, uh, but they get the benefit. And there are also uh, perceptions around sustainability and other, other things that may or may not, depending on what crop you're talking about, be accurate. So those are the things that I think then create that, that polar sort of pull. Final thought, Aaron. I mean, I, I would say in the sense of being passive versus active, I think the way we can be active is by being as a part of the organic community is partnering with people to say, hey, is there science here that we would really consider? And then if we believe in that science, then how can we help talk to consumers about what that looks like? And I think we're still in the stages of having that upfront part of the discussion to see what is real and beneficial. And I'm very hopeful that, that I'm always for leveraging science to improve things. Um, especially if you can do it in a way that stays true to, you know, to the fundamentals of what we believe from an organic space. You know, there's no perfect solution. And to his point, it took 500 pages to define a word. And so right there, you know <laughs> that it's imperfect because there's no way that we've legislated exactly organic to mean what people think it means. But I think we have to continue to strive to deliver that because that's what's important is delivering the best nutrition that we can and leveraging the techniques that are appropriate to do that and then trying to keep consumer sentiment in line with, with where the science and, and that emotion meet up. So at, at this point, and, I, and I, uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to uh, join me in thanking our speakers, but I'm, I'm just going to give you a preview. Uh, after uh, we conclude here, uh, you go through the elevator bay and then hook a left at the reception desk, and uh, lunch is served uh, right outside the Minnesota room, and then I think we can take the lunch into the Minnesota room, right? Uh, and, and then we have our uh, concluding session on innovation, uh, which I think you're really going to enjoy. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that our panelists would entertain your questions during lunch or out in the hall, et cetera, if you didn't have a chance or were too shy to ask it today. But please give me, uh, or please join me in thanking our terrific panel for their uh, wonderful words. Thank you.